Well, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me here. Um, I'm very glad to be part uh, of this panel. Uh, the first period of gentrification from the 1960s to the 1980s of single unit renovations powered often by sweat equity proved the viability of the inner city for middle class residency, thereby providing the, the R&D, the market testing, for larger but more risk averse builders. Through the 1990s and since, larger corporate players have entered the picture, including transnational development corporations in the largest projects, engaging, as we all know, in new build construction, often on brownfield sites. Now, when we turn away from the Euro-American core areas of gentrification to the principal focus of planetary gentrification, this early pre-1990s model quite properly is largely missing. I remember spending a futile day and a half in Tokyo in the 1990s looking for precisely this type of gentrification, renovation led. It didn't exist. So too in Hong Kong, the term gentrification is scarcely part of the popular or academic vocabulary. And the district of Soho, or south of Hollywood Street, in Hong Kong's central district is the exception that proves the rule for this cosmopolitan expat bar and arts district, flashing a London and New York signature does indeed have a few noted examples of renovation, gentrification, but they have been undertaken by the expats who are themselves familiar with the British, European, and American models. So what we find outside Euro-America is typically not gentrification in its initial Ruth Glass form, but new build, rental and condo apartments, sometimes constructed following large consumption projects or public infrastructure. This is the typical landscape covered in planetary gentrification. Let me say at the outset that the superb project behind this book will provide the oxygen for the next decade or longer of discussion in this field. It's difficult to think of a comparable project in urban geography in recent years so audacious, not just in its objectives, but also uh, in its accomplishments. We've heard the scale of the project, two research workshops, one in London, one in Santiago, with invitations to scholars outside the Euro-American core region which is de-emphasized and a number of gentrification scholars will be disappointed to say, say that the names do not appear in the index. Um, and then the uh, special issues, the books, uh, and as we've also heard today, uh, the co-production of knowledge, quite, I, th I think, uh, an exciting experiment uh, in terms of collegial learning. The second positive point I want to make, because I am, after all, a critic, uh, and so I will have some other points after my second one, uh, is that it brings the housing question to the forefront of human geography, where I think, quite rightly, it belongs. Um, today, in everyday life, housing shapes the meaning of many places, of many cities affordability issues, availability issues, quality issues, striving to ownership, ownership as investment and pension strategy, ownership in terms of buy to rent, ownership in terms of transnational purchases. I found it fascinating to learn that uh, in 2012 in London, 
out of all completions, housing completions in London in 2012, 10% were sold in Hong Kong and Singapore. Is the scale of transnational purchases. I won't go on and talk about the economic geography, the political geography, and the role that uh, housing now plays in this field. Housing is absolutely central player today uh, in the human geography of places, and I think this book highlights that very uh, effectively. Now, with the kind of range that the book uh, aspires to and achieves, there's a big task of integrating so much diversity into a coherent argument. How to manage, how to contain such complexity. There's an inevitable challenge here of conceptual sprawl the incorporation of diverse empirical material into a coherent uh, scholarly unit. Now, concern about the elasticity of the term gentrification has been expressed before. Has gentrification indeed become a synonym for urban renewal, as the book suggests, albeit a more critical take on urban renewal? But the book tells us urban renewal does not limit the reach of gentrification, for the authors state that the inner city site of the process should not be privileged. We might look for gentrification, they point out, in the suburbs, as I have done recently with a graduate student, where it's often associated with transit-oriented development. We can look on the urban fringe, tied in perhaps with new urbanism, and in rural areas as well accompanying counter-urbanization. In each of these cases, more affluent occupants replace or displace poorer occupants. And that act of resettlement raises a question of social justice that has always given gentrification its critical edge. Now, this is an entirely defensible position, but in departing so far from Notting Hill or the Mission District, is it a flexible or a promiscuous concept that we are left with? This stripped-down definition of gentrification as the injustice of class succession in almost any geographic locale might also allow the entry of the landlord-driven Scottish clearances, defined in one essay as an enforced simultaneous eviction of all families living in a given area. Reflections there, perhaps, of council estate clearances in London today. And what about the systematic English enclosure movement, described by E.P. Thompson as a plain enough case of class robbery? With the stripped-down definition, is that also a legitimate case? of gentrification. I think one of the questions that the authors leave for us and for future work is how and why to, to limit this growing appetite for jurisdictional enlargement. Can such a busy term as gentrification retain sufficient precision to be analytically useful? So that's my first question that I would like to raise. Then there's the significant challenge of making sense of this diversity of phenomena under the common rubric of gentrification. How to explain this diverse phenomenon? The authors acknowledge the play of comparative urbanism, post-colonialism, and political economy in their framing of an explanatory perspective. I note, however, that Jamie Peck and also Alan Scott and Michael Storper have written in the last 12 months or so that comparative urbanism and post-colonial urbanism often present themselves as against political economy, with political economy characterized by these other positions uh, as uh, universal, 
economistic, obscuring the life world of the southern city in general, but also the detailed everyday life of all cities beneath a will to theoretical abstraction. In contrast, Peck sees comparative and post-colonial urbanism as offering what he calls a new provincialism, estranged from political economy. So how do the authors square this circle as they invoke all three theoretical perspectives? Do they see potential for fruitful integration in these different positions? Or do the positions coexist in the book, but not cohere. And then, you see the title there of chapter three, let's look at the new economics, which is implicated in explanation. A global economic model activated and steered by the state with a distinction drawn between post-socialist states and others. The content of this economic model seems to correspond with the political economy launched by David Harvey and others in the 1970s and 1980s, where key ideas include the two circuits of capital, capital switching, and the rent gap. But I do wonder if there is enough analytical firepower in that uh, position for the purpose at hand. What about the centrality of the state in the book? In the urban political economy of the 70s and 80s, the state did not appear as a player with substantial theoretical visibility or historical capacity. It was the logic of capital that ruled the city's roost. I'm not saying the state was absent but for the theorists, its role was a lesser concern. In that respect, a striking feature of this book is the primary role of the state as a geographical actor and its ascendancy over other actors. We are in, we are told, an era of state hegemony. I'm quoting from the book, The State plays a key role, or again, the key actor in planetary gentrification is the state, neoliberal or authoritarian. It is the state that is the key constituent of gentrification in the global south and east. If that is indeed the case, we might ask how well an earlier political economy, which did not hold this conviction, provides appropriate theoretical guidance. So, in conclusion, I want to reassert, and this should be the principal takeaway from my commentary, that the large project of which planetary urbanism is one output has decisively advanced the field of gentrification in a giant step forward. In fact, I'll say more than that. The ambition and achievement of such a wide-ranging collaborative project I think is an object lesson for the discipline as a whole. At a time when many of us pursue esoteric topics with limited societal payoff, this superb project illuminates in the most trenchant manner the heart of a major existential problem of our time, the growing commodification, inequality, and injustice of the urban housing market.